Every day we're faced with this question. What should I eat? Often the underlying context is, is this good for me? Is this bad for me? Does eating X cause disease Y? Ideally, we'd look to nutrition research to make evidence-based decisions. And we're being constantly bombarded with sciencey sounding nutrition info through the media, influencers, and your mom. But how good is this information? Well, depends on the messenger and how well they both understand and translate the science. Can the science answer whether eating X causes disease Y? Well, that depends on the study design. Today, we're gonna dig into the different kinds of study designs used in nutrition research, where they fit on the hierarchy of evidence and how that helps us know whether eating X causes disease Y. Plus, maybe even help you develop your own science spidey sense to fact check that influencer. Let's science it. Hey, welcome to Nourishful. I'm Dr. Lara, and I like root beer. Sweet, with more depth of flavor than other pops like colas. But pop, as this Canadian says, or soda as most Americans call it, has a pretty bad reputation when it comes to health, especially for metabolic diseases like type 2 diabetes. Does drinking pop cause type 2 diabetes? I'm going to use this research question as an example to guide us through the different types of study designs and how they fit into the hierarchy of evidence. But first, some vocabulary. Health studies investigate relationships between exposures and outcomes. In nutrition research, the exposure is usually something food-related. In our case, drinking pop, or sugar-sweetened beverage consumption, as it's usually called in the literature. The outcome is the end point that we're interested in. In our case, type 2 diabetes. Does the exposure cause the outcome? Does drinking pop cause type 2 diabetes? How directly a research study can address this question depends on where it fits within this pyramid. Voila! I present to you the hierarchy of evidence. This pyramid is a framework used to rank the strength and quality of different types of research studies according to their design. Study designs that form the base are good for helping scientists generate hypotheses, or educated guesses. Study designs at the top of the pyramid can help us establish causality, whether an exposure causes an outcome. The bottom of our pyramid is made up of animal and cell studies, basically studies that aren't done in whole humans. For example, this study in rats showed that drinking certain types of sugar impaired function of the pancreas, fat, and muscle in ways that lead to diabetes. And this study of diabetic pancreas cells shows the nitty-gritty details of how insulin production gets all gummed up. Animal and cell studies have many benefits. The researchers have meticulous control over the exposure. It's a lot easier to make sure that a rat doesn't lie about how much pop they drink compared to a human. Plus, we can measure outcomes that give mechanistic insight about what's going on at the molecular level, like taking pretty invasive samples of organs. Look, I'm into volunteering for research, but no, you may not have a sample of my brain. But there are many major differences about how individual cells act in a dish compared to a whole living organism, and big differences between you and a rat. So read past the headlines to see if a study was done on cells or animals, because this type of research is low on our hierarchy of evidence. The next lower level is case studies. Case studies are reports about humans, sometimes just one human. For example, this case study described an infant born with dangerously high insulin levels delivered by a woman who reported drinking two liters per day of a sugary drink called Lucozade Energy. It's tempting to say that the energy drink caused the infant's insulin problems, but we just can't know that for sure because of the study design. Case studies are full of bias since we don't have anybody to directly compare to. We didn't get to measure the exposure very well, and we don't have multiple cases with similar exposures to show us how likely an outcome is. So case studies can't tell us about causation. These studies are still valuable for rare outcomes or exposures, like the very first time a pregnant person reported drinking so much leucosate energy. This can help scientists develop hypotheses and design new research studies. You know what else are like case studies? 
anecdotes. So next time you see before and after photos of some miracle weight loss shake on your newsfeed, just remember how low case studies are in the hierarchy of evidence. Our next layer is cross-sectional studies. These are snapshots in time. Snapshots of an exposure and an outcome in a population. For example, this study published in the Journal of Nutrition investigated the relationship between drinking sugary beverages and having pre-diabetes within the U.S. Hispanic Latino population. The researchers asked a group of almost 10,000 adults in the Hispanic Latino community about everything they ate and drank on two separate days. Tell me everything you ate and drank from midnight to midnight. Well, I had avocado toast and a nitro cold brew for breakfast then the Beyond Burger with sweet potato fries and a soda for lunch. Tell me more about the soda. How many eight ounce servings, what brand, was it diet or regular? And took blood tests to determine whether they have pre-diabetes. Essentially, the researchers got a snapshot of how many sugary drinks they drank that day and whether they currently have pre-diabetes. What they found was that people who reported drinking two or more sugary drinks per day had a 30% higher chance of currently having pre-diabetes. Cross-sectional studies are good for initially exploring a relationship between an exposure and an outcome. They're pretty quick and dirty to do, and way less expensive than other types of studies. But since they're a snapshot in time, they can't tell us about causality. Did you drink a pop today? Do you have diabetes today? There are many weaknesses of this kind of snapshot. Is today a typical day in your dietary pattern? Does drinking one soda cause diabetes, or do you have to drink 10 sodas a day for 10 years to cause diabetes? Did you stop drinking soda after you were diagnosed? How likely is diabetes to develop in the absence of drinking sodas? These aren't questions that can be addressed by single snapshots. Cross-sectional studies can tell us about correlations between current exposures and current outcome status. But correlation is not causation. Correlation, correlation is, not, is causation. not causation. Moving up a layer in our hierarchy is the case control study. These are studies where researchers recruit a group of people with the outcome of interest, like a particular disease, and call them their cases. Then they recruit another group of people who don't have that outcome, like people without that particular disease, and call them controls. Then the researchers look backwards to see what the participants were exposed to in the past to see if there are different exposures between the cases and the controls. This case control study published by a team of researchers from the Karolinska Institute in Sweden investigated the relationship between sugary drinks and type 2 diabetes. They recruited about a thousand people who had recently been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes as their cases, and a similar number of non-diabetic adults as their controls. All the participants were asked to fill out a giant survey called a food frequency questionnaire, which asks them to report how frequently and what serving size of practically all foods and beverages they ate over the past year. For the cases, the researchers asked them to specifically answer based on what they consumed for the year prior to their diagnosis. This is called a retrospective analysis, so the researchers are looking backwards at exposures. What they found was that people who reported drinking two or more servings of sugar-sweetened beverages per day had a three-fold higher chance of having type 2 diabetes, compared to people who reported drinking none. Every additional serving was associated with a 20% greater likelihood of having diabetes. So this data sounds pretty convincing. Now can we say that pop causes diabetes? Mm, no. Case control studies are observational, so the researchers are only able to estimate soda drinking based on participants' memory as opposed to controlling it. The biggest limitation of case control studies in nutrition is recall bias. In the year before your diagnosis, how often did you drink pop? Yikes! Was there something I did that caused my disease? I have cola at the movies, uh, Mountain Dew at lunch, and a cream soda nightcap. Yikes! Maybe all my hydration came from soda pop. Often, if you've just been diagnosed with a disease, you may wonder whether there's anything that you did that caused the disease, and that can impact how you report your dietary habits. This can lead to a really unreliable and biased exposure measurement. 
Case control studies in nutrition can tell us about associations between past dietary intakes and current outcome status, but they have their weaknesses with recall bias and they can't tell us about cause. Midway up our hierarchy are prospective cohort studies. This kind of study allows researchers to see if there's an association between an exposure and risk of developing a particular outcome in the future. Where case controlled studies were retrospective or looking backwards, prospective cohort studies are looking forwards. And what is a cohort, you may ask? A cohort is just a group of people with some shared characteristic. For example, my kindergarten class would be a cohort. Aw, look at us cute kids from the 90s! This prospective cohort study by a team of Harvard researchers investigated the relationship between sugar sweetened beverages and risk of developing type 2 diabetes. They recruited over 40,000 male physicians who didn't have diabetes back in 1986, and then followed their data for 20 years. In the last year, how often did you consume con carbonated beverages with caffeine or sugar? Like Coke, Pepsi, Mountain Dew, um, Dr. Pepper? Oh, I love Mountain Dew. Mm -hmm. I keep a mini fridge full of the stuff in my office. Mm -hmm. I buy two 30 packs a week. Uh, I don't drink them all. Usually two or three roll over into the next week, so let's say 47 12-ounce cans a week. 47 per week. Okay. Let's try and find the multiple choice answer that best reflects how frequently you do the do. Looks like six or more servings per day. I'm a doctor. Do as I say, not as I do. And just to confirm, you do not have diabetes? Nope. My doc says, just keep doing what I'm doing. What they found was that the doctors who reported drinking the highest amounts of sugary drinks had a 24% greater risk of developing type 2 diabetes compared to the doctors who drank none. When looking at the data another way, they found that one sugary drink per day was associated with a 16% increased risk of developing type 2 diabetes. So that sounds pretty compelling. Now can we say that soda causes diabetes? Still no. Prospective cohort studies are observational. Since researchers didn't control the exposure, we can't make causational statements. There are some other weaknesses too, like whether results from these mostly white male doctors would be the most informative about larger, diverse populations, how accurately the diet questionnaires actually reflect what they really ate, and whether the statistics fully corrected for all the other contributors to diabetes risk. On the other hand, prospective cohort studies are especially powerful tools for studying health conditions that take many years or even decades to develop. And those nutrition surveys are pretty decent at differentiating between super high and super low consumers. So while we can't make causational statements, and we shouldn't rely on just one narrowly defined cohort, looking at multiple cohort studies can give us pretty compelling evidence about the relationship between an exposure and an outcome. Getting closer to the top are randomized controlled trials. Or if we want to get really fancy, randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trials. Try saying that three times fast. Randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial, randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial, randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial. Researchers recruited a group of participants and randomized them to either an exposure of interest, say drinking soda, or a control, say drinking carbonated water. At the end, they compare how many people developed the outcome of interest, say type 2 diabetes, between the soda group and the control group. Double blind means that neither the participant or the researcher knows who is in what group. Placebo controlled means that the control group is exposed to something that is indistinguishable from the test exposure and biologically inert. Though in nutrition research, it's tough to create a perfect placebo. Whoa, worst soda ever. Randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trials are considered the gold standard in research because they're designed to reduce bias and isolate the impact of just the exposure on the outcome by comparing it to the control. 
Doing this in practice can be pretty challenging in nutrition. In this study published in the journal Nutrients, researchers recruited 85 people and they divided them into four beverage groups. These groups differed by the proportion of daily calories derived from high fructose corn syrup sweetened drinks. Their 0% energy beverage was the control, which was sweetened with aspartame. Then there was a 10% daily energy drink, a 17.5 energy drink, and a 25% energy drink. So in this last group, a full quarter of the day's calories came from the sweetened beverage. Participants drank three of their assigned beverages a day for 15 days. The researchers measured insulin sensitivity and liver fat at the beginning and the end of the study. What they found was that the participants who drank higher amounts of high fructose corn syrup developed worse insulin sensitivity and accumulated more liver fat compared to the aspartame control. Since this was a gold standard style study design, now can we say that soda causes type 2 diabetes? Still, no. First off, because this study didn't actually measure type 2 diabetes. Instead, the outcomes were insulin sensitivity and liver fat, two factors that are along the pathway towards developing type 2 diabetes and a related condition called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. This is actually quite common in nutrition trials because often the outcomes we're interested in take years or even decades to develop like type 2 diabetes, as well as cardiovascular disease and some types of cancer. There are some other common caveats to many nutrition trials too, like how well the research conditions model real life and whether the placebo control may cause its own biological impacts. However, randomized controlled trials are the closest to shedding insight on a causal relationship between an exposure and an outcome. In this case, between drinking high fructose corn syrup, sweetened soda, and factors on the pathway towards type 2 diabetes. Though we can never be super confident in results from just one lonely study all by itself. Which brings us to the tippity top of our hierarchy of evidence, the meta-analysis. Maybe we should call this the diamond standard? A meta-analysis is a study of studies. It's a way for researchers to look at a lot of different studies that have investigated the same topic and then use statistics to combine the results of all those studies to get a bigger picture of what the research as a whole is telling us. This meta-analysis was conducted by a team of researchers from the China Agricultural University. They compiled prospective cohort studies that were investigating the relationship between drinking sugary drinks and risk of developing type 2 diabetes. Looking at all the studies together, they found a 29% increased risk for developing diabetes when comparing the highest sugary drink intakes to the lowest intakes. Looking at the data another way, they found that one additional sugary drink per day was associated with a 27% increased risk of type 2 diabetes. Positive dose relationships like this support the hypothesis that sugary drinks may cause type 2 diabetes, though we still can't say cause for sure because these were all observational studies. Though in my opinion, well-constructed meta-analyses of prospective cohort studies are pretty darn close to shedding insight on cause in nutrition. This meta-analysis included over 645,000 participants from nine different countries. So this greater population size and diversity allows us to make stronger conclusions. Plus, since these studies followed the cohorts for so long, they can measure actual disease outcomes rather than biomarkers, as is common in randomized controlled trials. To recap, study designs on the lower levels of our evidence hierarchy are good for generating hypotheses, whereas the higher levels can give us insights about causation. Cell and animal studies teach us about mechanisms. Case studies are like anecdotes. Cross-sectional studies are snapshots in time. Case control studies allow us to look backwards at exposures. Prospective cohort studies allow us to look forwards at outcomes. Randomized control trials can potentially tell us about cause, but usually for shorter term outcomes. And meta-analyses are the sum of studies. Now note that I said insight about cause, but not definite cause. Nutrition scientists get pretty bristly about using the word cause. 
Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And as we've learned, there are strengths and weaknesses for all of these study designs and what we can learn about nutrition. When you see media headlines and nutrition influencers throwing around the word cause, hopefully your science spidey sense will start to bristle too. So if nutrition research can rarely tell us whether eating X causes disease Y, then what's the point? My nourishable take is that you can look to both meta-analyses of randomized controlled trials and prospective cohort studies to get a sense of how consistent the research is on the relationship between an exposure and an outcome. For me, I'm pretty compelled by the weight of the studies all the way up the hierarchy of evidence on the relationship between sugary drinks and type 2 diabetes. Looking at all the evidence up our hierarchy is like taking all the pieces of a puzzle and putting them together to see the complete picture. Though I won't say drinking pop definitely causes diabetes, I need to throw in a lot of qualifiers there, I'm convinced that I should keep my root beer consumption to a minimum. That's what science tastes like. Thanks for tuning in to Nourishable. Check out links to all the example studies I cited today in the video description, plus links to the whole hierarchy of evidence video series with deeper dives into each study design. If you value this content, support Nourishable on Patreon. Buy us a root beer or maybe a coffee. There are some meta-analyses of prospective cohort studies showing that coffee is associated with good health outcomes. And be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all things nutrition.